Welcome to the Rideshare Dojo. If you're an Uber or Lyft driver or anyone in the gig economy, this is the place for you. With tips and techniques, interviews with passengers and industry leaders, entertainment, inspiration, motivation. Here, with over 23,000 rides, is your host, Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart drivers, Postmates, Ease, Zoom drivers, DoorDash, Via, Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Now, Uber Eats, Grubhub, all you drivers and passengers and all of us who are part of this big, beautiful gig economy, welcome. It is so great to have you here for today's exciting episode. My name is Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Our topic today is the ongoing story of AB5 and its impact on drivers such as you and me and uh, companies. Companies. So we're going to look at this in a few different ways. Uh, we're going to start out by talking about DoorDash. All right, so DoorDash is definitely been in the news because uh, they've had some issues with their, uh, their arbitration clause. Then I'm going to share some information um, I got attending. I spoke on a panel in San Francisco at a restaurant called Manny's, uh, which is at 16th and Valencia. And the panel discussion was about AB5 and work, gig work, and gig work specifically in California. And I had a couple of heavyweights there with me and learned a thing or two. So I'll share about that. And I'll give you a little update on my own arbitration case, my legal case, and how it is proceeding. All right. So DoorDash. All right. So I just wrote an article all about DoorDash. And the title of the ar article that I submitted is Arbitration is Backfiring on DoorDash. So DoorDash, <clears throat> as you all know, is a company that delivers food. And uh, like Uber and like Lyft, when you start to drive for them, you have to, you know, sign off on their agreements, right? You don't really have a choice. If you don't click, I agree, um, you're not going to drive for, for those companies. They all have these uh, agreements that you got to click through. I don't know if anybody actually reads them, but you click through and you click, I agree. Well, one of the things you agree to is that if you have a, uh, a legal issue, a challenge to the company, you cannot uh, take them to court and you can also not uh, come together and combine your claims with other drivers. Um, so all you can do is file an individual case with an arbitrator, and then an arbitrator will uh, make a ruling, and that's that. Okay, So that's how these companies have set it up. And their thinking was that, that the price to arbitrate would be high, and therefore... Uh, since the drivers wouldn't be getting much money from whatever they were, you know, filing their claim about, that not many people, it would be prohibitive, prohibitive for, for drivers to pursue arbitration. So then AB5 happened, and that happened at the beginning of the year. So what over 5,000 DoorDash drivers did was they all filed an ind their individual uh, arbitration claims. And that... Uh, produced a big problem for DoorDash because DoorDash has a law firm and that law firm said that's going to cost us tw cost you 12 million dollars <laughs> to uh to uh, deal with all of that. So what DoorDash then did is uh they approached uh a judge and said hold on hold on hold on here. We have to be we have to allow all of these uh arbitration cases to be combined together kind of like a, like a class action suit. And the judge said, hold on, you, can't, you, cannot, you cannot have it both ways, right? Um, so there's an article uh, by Quartz that said, DoorDash is learning just how binding arbitration is. The judge said no. DoorDash ordered into individual arbitration with 5,000 workers. So the judge, a, a very cool judge named William Alsup, 
heard both sides, and he ruled decisively against DoorDash. And I'll read you just a little bit of what he wrote. For decades, the employer sidebar and their employer clients have forced arbitration clauses upon workers, that's you and me, thus taking away their right to go to court and forced class action waivers upon them too, thus taking away their ability to join collectively to vindicate common rights, right? So as drivers, we can't like form a union. It's against the law. The employer sidebar has succeeded in the United States Supreme Court to sustain such provisions. The irony in this case, this is the DoorDash case, where 5,000 individual uh, drivers have filed their arbitration case. The irony in this case is that the workers wish to enforce the very provisions forced on them by seeking, even if by the thousands, individual arbitrations, the remnant of procedural rights left to them. So this is, in other words, the only thing we can do as drivers is file an individual arbitration uh, case against uh, Uber or Lyft or DoorDash or Caviar, you know, any of these any of these companies where you feel uh, because you've been classified as an independent contractor, when by law now you need to be classified as an employee, you're entitled to some kind of compensation. The judge went on to say, <clears throat> the employer here, DoorDash, uh, faced with having to actually honor its side of the bargain, now blanches at the cost of the filing fees it agreed to pay in the arbitration clause. No doubt, DoorDash never expected that so many would actually seek arbitration. Instead, in irony upon irony, DoorDash now wishes to resort to a class-wide lawsuit, the very device it deemed to it denied to the workers to avoid its duty to arbitrate. This hypocrisy, <laughs> this is great, this is what the judge that wrote, this hypocrisy will not be blessed, at least by this order. So... Pretty strong words, and he's basically telling uh, DoorDash you can't have it both ways. Instead, in irony upon irony, DoorDash now wishes to resort to a class-wide lawsuit, the very device it denied to the workers to avoid its duty to arbitrate. This hypocrisy will not uh, will not be blessed, at least by this order. So, <clears throat> there you go. So, DoorDash has its hands full with over 5,000 uh, arbitration um, cases. And uh, uh, I know Uber and Lyft are probably getting quite a few of those as well. So we are a land of laws. <clears throat> Sometimes it seems like the big corporations always win and the little guys, little drivers like us, like you and me get screwed. But here's a case in which the judge stood up for the working man, the working man, and forced DoorDash to honor its independent contractor arbitration agreement. And we don't know how it's going to turn out. We don't know when, when a, uh, an arbit arbiter, an arbitration person makes a decision. Will they rule for the company or will they work rule for the driver? That'll be very, very interesting to see when that happens and, um, and, and how that turns out. All right. So you can look for that article uh, I wrote on the Rideshare Guy about arbitration backfiring on DoorDash. All right, last, uh, let's see, I think it was the 12th of February, just about two weeks ago, I was invited to be a panelist uh, at a restaurant called Manny's in San Francisco. And the topic was um, AB5 and its impact on the gig economy and the gig economy and work and the future of work in California. So I was there uh, next to Ken uh, Jacobs, and he works over at UC Berkeley, and that guy knows labor and, and stuff like that, like the back of his hand. And then there was me in the middle with my rideshare guy t-shirt on and my normal driving attire, which is, uh, you know, my black uh, lift jacket and my black jeans and my keen shoes in my brightly colored bomba socks. There I was. And then next to me was a smart as shit guy named Anish Raman. This guy, this guy could talk, man. He, he's just got this comfort talking in front of a group of people. He obviously has done it quite a bit. He, um, 
he lived in Bangkok, so we had that in common. That was great. He's younger than me, so he's just kind of getting started with the whole having children thing and all that. But he worked for Obama, and uh, and right now he's working for Gavin Newsom, and he's heading up a commission on the future of work in California, where they're looking for solutions so that there isn't this big disparity between people at the bottom of earnings and the people at the top of earnings. So it was a, a great conversation. Um, I mostly spoke about um, how Uber has uh, tried to change uh, some of their policies to give the impression that, that the driver has more control so that the driver could be classified as an independent contractor. And I shared how that's created this kind of race to the bottom in terms of pricing. It's actually hurt us, and it hasn't actually given us any more control because the market forces really dictate what we're going to do. And uh, bottom line, not helping. We also talked about the ballot measure. And I believe it was Ken you know, said that they looked at it, and after you adjusted for expenses and da-da-da-da-da, it basically meant that the drivers could make like $7 an hour. So a lot of stuff got debunked uh, during this. Th- during this, And I also got some good questions from people. I actually got a question from a woman from Uber, which was great. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you want to find anything more about that, you can find their Twitter feed, Tech Equity Collaborative, Tech Equity. And um, yeah, and there's a bunch of pictures and things like that. But the thing I found interesting and what I wanted uh, to, sh- to share with you um, is that Ken uh, pointed out that as a result of technology, um, technology is actually creating more jobs than it's taking away. So I was under the impression that um, technology uh, was re- was replacing people, right? Robotics was replacing people, and that those people then did not have, you know, jobs to go to that were that would match their skill level. And while that's true, um, he said that there are actually more jobs being created than are being uh, replaced by machines. So technology is actually creating more jobs. Uh, it's just that the skill level required to do those jobs is higher. So there needs to be quite an emphasis put on education so that people who are in the lower, lower um, skill jobs, right, um, can can um, advance themselves with some education and then take on uh, take on some of these uh, jobs that are that are becoming available as a result. So it was pretty great. I, I enjoyed it, and um, yeah. So that was my experience, and that was a little bit that I learned that really made an impact on me. It made me much more hopeful for the future. Um, you know, I have a daughter, and I think about her, and you know, what's she going to do for work, and is it going to be something that a machine cannot take over. Now, she's going to go to medical school, and I don't believe machines are going to be able to take over uh, what doctors do. Um, I think there's always going to be a need for somebody to compassionately listen to somebody's uh, you know, a problem and then, and then be able to fix them, to heal them you know, for healers. So I feel good that she'll uh, continue to have work. But in order to get paid, she needs to have people who are making money, and it sounds like um, we're going to be okay as long as we're really diligent and, and make sure that uh, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. That's really what we need. All right. Third thing I said I would do is give you a little bit of an update. My attorney over at Potter Handy LLC, LLP um, said to me, Yesterday, Jay, I should be speaking to Lyft's attorney about your case in the next day or so. We're also filing your complaint with AAA. Now, for those of you who don't know what AAA, AAA is American Arbitration Association uh, for both Uber and Lyft this week. And I'll be discussing potential arbit- arbitrators with Uber's lawyers this week as well. So it just takes time, you know. Uh, first, you've got to request all this uh you know, paperwork from Uber and Lyft, they've got to provide the information. If they stall, you just got to wait them out. And uh, so it's been almost two and a half to three months now. And my case is going to have quite a bit of activity this week. And I'll keep you posted. I'll keep you posted and let you know how things are going. 
in my case against Uber and Lyft in order to get uh, compensated for uh, things that an employee would have been compensated for, but we were not uh, drivers because we were classified as independent contractors. So fingers crossed, uh, anything is better than nothing. And I'm hoping for six figures out of it. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. And I will let you know right here in the dojo. All right. So that's it for right now. That's a wrap. Fist bump to all you drivers out there. Uh, you all rock it out there every day. I honor you. I hope you uh, value learning about AB5 and its impact on those of us who are in California. It's an interesting time to be a worker in the gig economy. Uh, we're all just sort of adjusting to it and figuring it out day by day. Thank you for sharing your journey with me. Be safe out there. This is Nomad J, J Creator saying, this episode is in the can. Loved this episode of the Rideshare Dojo podcast? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps and it's very much appreciated. Be sure to visit RideshareDojo.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Thanks for listening and be safe out there.